But of all the institutions that God has given mankind, uh, the one that he begins with, the very first one we see in chapter 2 of Genesis, and it's called marriage. The institution of marriage. And this is the great overarching thought in our study this morning that I want you to see in your notes is that marriage matters so much to God that he created it before any other human institution. It starts right here in chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the blueprint for marriage. The Bible has a ton to say about marriage, but most of the time when we read passages like Ephesians 5, which we did not long ago, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 2, Deuteronomy 6, it gives us the how and the what, okay? You get the definition of marriage and you get the mechanics of marriage. It does not typically show you the why, and if you want to know the why of marriage, you've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And you don't see it until chapter 2. Chapter 1 is not enough because in that first chapter it says, on the sixth day of creation, you know, male and female, he created them. But that's an incomplete uh, view of marriage. He doesn't give us the full picture in chapter 1. So we've got to look at chapter 2 to see what God accomplished everything that was revealed over the sequence of, of what was probably several hours on day six. He didn't simply just fashion man and woman as two lumps of, of dirt, okay? He, he didn't fashion them both from the dust simultaneously. He didn't see a couple arise from the dust hand in hand. No, he created one individual man, and then from there, we're going to see in chapter two that some important things are said by God and by man. And then some important things are done. Some important things take place. And then finally, we're going to see something very important that is written and recorded by the human author of this book. This is going to be a fascinating little study here today. Would you join me in prayer before we dive in? Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing upon our time and your word today. May you just uh, make it vibrant and alive to us today. May we understand and appreciate this important very first foundation, what it means for us, what your design is for it, God. And I pray it will make a difference in how we see our lives, our relationships, that we might bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this is not going to be a marriage seminar today. There's going to be some practical things that I'm sure that we'll, we'll cover here. But our focus is going to be on the fact that this is the first human structure that he created. It's important. It's important to God. Marriage matters to God. Not only is it the first institution that he created, what was the site of Jesus' first public miracle? It was a wedding all right, it was a wedding. He turned the water into wine. Now, he could have he done anything for his first miracle. He could have made any locale the site for his first miracle. He could have done it at the Jordan River. He could have done it at the Galilee, okay? He could have walked on water. That could have been his first miracle. He could have done this at a funeral, could have raised the dead. That would have made a pretty impressive first miracle. But he chose a wedding. I think there's a reason why. What is the picture of God's relationship with his church? It's a groom and a bride, and we see that in Scripture. What is the union that will take place one day when the church is presented to Christ? There will be a wedding one day. There will be a beautiful marriage of the Lamb when the church, the bride of Christ, will be presented in radiant white, pure and holy. And so marriage matters to God. It shows up all throughout his book. It is prominent in the Word of God. But it shows up right here first. And marriage we will look at now in your notes as presented for the very first time in Genesis chapter 2. And the first thing that I want you to see in your notes is that God anticipates man's need. God anticipates man's need. And we're going to see this in verse 18. Having created Adam, God makes an observation. He sees what Adam does not see or feel. He sees what man doesn't see. Adam appears to have everything he could ever need, all right? He's got all the sustenance. He's surrounded. I mean, he's in Eden, for crying out loud. He's surrounded by beauty. He's in fellowship with God. What more could he need? Well, God knows. And he makes a statement in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, and what follows in his words are the elimination of something and the establishment of something. He's going to give a negative, and he's going to give a positive. And he says, it is not good that the man should be alone. And all the men in the house said, 
Oh, you know, I, I was pretty weak, I gotta say. I was really hoping for your sake that you would be more robust because your wife is waiting for that amen, you know? You may have just determined what the rest of your day will be like, fellas, I'm just telling you. And don't forget, there's football on today, so. It's not good for the man to be alone, okay? After the six days of creation, what did every day end with? It is good, it is good, it is good. And now here's God, it's not good. What's not good? Aloneness. Aloneness is not good. Why not? Because man is created in the image of God. Has God ever been alone? Never, ever has God been alone. Uh, He is always perpetually in community with himself, in the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit. If he had been lonely, some people say, well, he created us all because he was lonely. Uh Uh-uh. No, God did not create us because he was lonely. If God created us because he was lonely, that's a weak God. That is not a self-sufficient God. That's insufficiency right there. But he created us out of his strength. You see, the universe does, uh, does nothing for God that he needs. All right? He doesn't need us. We need him. Uh, he enjoys the universe. He is glorified through the universe. He shares himself with the universe, but he needs nothing. He's never been alone. In fact, Jesus says in John 17, 5, he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So before any of us were here, he had fellowship. He was not lonely, but man is lonely. Man is not created in community. Up to this moment when God spoke everything into being, and you know that formula that he used, let there be and there was, when he would create sea life, he would say let there be, and suddenly all the sea mammals, all the fish were there. Uh, Let there be birds in the heavens, and all of the birds at once were there. Let there be beasts in the field, and all at once herds were there. But when he creates man, he does not speak man into being. He forms him from the dust, and he does not form an entire race of men. He forms one man, one guy. Why? Why didn't he provide him with company from the beginning? Because he wants Adam to see something. He wants Adam to understand that it's not good to be alone. It's not good. Why is it not good? Because aloneness does not correspond with the image of God, the triunity of God. And so God acknowledges that, but he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't simply say it's not good, that man should be alone. He does something about it. He says, I will make a helper fit for him. All right, man, I'm gonna give you another shot here. And all the men said, okay, well, that was a little better. That was a little better. Uh, a helper, fit for him. I love that phrase right there. The old English word, you might have a King James that says, I'll make a help meet for him. A help meet, that word implies suitability, a helper fit for him. See, there's nobody that is on his level. He's got God above him. He's got plant life, animal life below him. He needs someone with him. And folks, that's what marriage is. Men, you've got a helper. You know why? Because you need help. You need help. Amen. God, amen. See, the women know how to say amen. They, and all the ladies said, amen. Oh, that's how you do that. That's right. No, God says he needs a helper. He, he, God does not say he needs a sex partner. God does not say he needs children. Although we do, we do need those things. But you need a helper because although those are wonderful benefits of marriage, the primary need of marriage is the elimination of loneliness. The elimination of loneliness and the establishment of intimate companionship. And that's where marriage must begin. And for the believer, romantic love starts, it is born out of respect. And respect is kindled by godly treatment. You guys who want a wife, you better learn how to treat women in a godly manner. That's where you begin. You start with treating people in a godly manner, and that produces respect. And without respect, there cannot be romantic love. When did you fall in love with your mate? We've all got our stories. I'll never forget when I met my wife, Deanna. I used to travel with a music group back when I was in my 20s, and we were in California. I was out of college, and so this is, this is what I did for a living. I traveled with a music group, and we toured up and down the coast there, and I'd done this for about a year, and I was, I was kind of restless. I was alone. I was single. I was lonely. 
You know, and I just, I just wanted to see what else was out there. I was going to pursue music. I had an audition in Nashville. I was going to fly out, audition with a music group in Nashville, Tennessee. But the day before I was to leave, I had a concert with this group. And we were at this little church in Yorba Linda, California. And I'll never forget, I was standing in the lobby. I was working the product table with one of my teammates. And we were talking. And as we were talking, this girl walks into the lobby and catches my eye. And I just watched her go. And she just went into the worship center. And pretty soon, the person talking to me is like, hello, woo Scott, where'd you go, you know? And after the concert, the, the, uh, the worship pastor comes up to our director, and he says, hey, do you guys need another girl singer? Because we got a girl, she could sing the stars down, son. I mean, you should, you, you should audition her. And so our director auditioned this girl who happened to be Deanna. And so I'm kind of lurking in the shadows, you know, <laughs> watching this audition, and uh, later, uh, my director and I were loading equipment on the bus, and he knew the next morning I'm flying to Nashville. Like, I'm out. I'm out. And we're loading the speaker on the bus, and I said, so, uh, you audition that girl? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, is she any good? He says, she's pretty good. I said, yeah. <laughs> you uh, you going you gonna to put her on the team, or? And he goes, I'm thinking about it. I said, hmm, interesting. If you put her on the team, I'll stay another year. <laughs> I'm not kidding, man. Now, I don't think that had any bearing on his decision, but he put her on the team, and I stayed another year. And I, I found out pretty soon after she came aboard the team that she had a boyfriend. She had a boyfriend, and word was it was pretty serious. Like, I, they, they were probably going to get engaged, you know? And I remember my mom calling me. I may have shared this with you before. She calls me and she just check it in, you know, with her single son. And she's like, any girls on the team? And I said, well, yeah. I go, there's this one. Oh, tell me about her. Well, she's got a boyfriend. My mom is like, well, I'll just pray him out of there, you know. <laughs> you need a mom like that, you know. I'm like, okay, mom, you do that. But I, I purposed in my heart that I would not pursue this girl while she was dating this guy. I wanted to treat her in a godly manner. I'd been in a relationship where a guy stole my girlfriend once, and that, that hurt. And so I wanted to honor that, that commitment. I wanted to be a, a godly man uh, toward her. And uh, now that's not to say that I didn't try to look and smell as good as possible when I was around her, okay? Okay. <laughs> But I purposed that I would do this. I would not pursue her. And it wasn't easy because the boyfriend would come and visit a lot. And we'd all go to dinner, you know, and I'd have to sit there as he's sitting next to her. He's got his arm around her, you know, and I'm, you know, the night's wearing on. And I'm like, okay, night over, night over. Go home, dude, you know. And, and then at the end of the night, without fail, Deanna would come up to me and she'd say sweetly, Scott. And I'd go, yes. <laughs> and she'd bat those long eyelashes, you know, and she'd go, can my boyfriend stay in your apartment tonight? And I'm like, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, and because I had a rollaway bed. That dude slept on my rollaway bed so many times. I wanted to put rocks under the mattress so bad, but I didn't, you know. And as this wore on, I'll never forget, my roommate comes in one day and he goes, hey, did you hear? Did you hear? And I go, what? And he said, Deanna broke up with her boyfriend. I go, Really? Interesting. And I went in my bedroom, I shut my door, and I was like, game on, you know. <laughs> and six months later, we were engaged. Uh, praise the Lord. Anyway, listen, uh, this is the necessity of marriage. It's the elimination of loneliness. But the elimination of loneliness has the prerequisite of godly behavior. You must treat your, your potential mate with godliness. And if you're the woman, you must treat your, your uh, potential mate with godliness and respect. And if that's not there, you have no foundation from which to build a marriage. If all you've got is physical attraction, if you think that's your ticket out of loneliness, prepare to be very, very lonely. Because that is not a foundation. And so God is going to do something here. He's going to help Adam out because Adam does not realize his need. 
And so God is going to help him with a visual aid. And he gives him a job. He says, Adam, name the critters. Verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Now some of you are like, how could this all be accomplished in one day? Uh, You remember that Adam was supernatural. He was perfect. He was far more capable than you or I in a variety of ways. Uh, Beyond that, we don't know necessarily that he's naming every animal in existence. It says beast of the field, bird of the air. There's no fish here. There's no sea life here. Uh, We don't know what beast of the field may mean. Could just be the more domesticated livestock type creatures. Nonetheless, verse 20, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. And he he was obedient. Now, did God ask him to do this because God didn't have the time to categorize and name all of these animals? He needed Adam to do that? No. He didn't ask Adam to do something that he had a need for. He gave Adam this job because Adam had a need that he needed to be aware of. And as he's naming these creatures, he's noticing Mr. Horse has a Mrs. Horse. And he's noticing that the bull has... Mrs. Cow. And there's a male and there's a female in every species. And it says, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. There's no Mrs. Adam. And so in your notes, God gives man an awareness of his need. He gives man an awareness of his need. And most men have that awareness early on these days, okay? Adam did not know his need. Adam was only six hours old. I was aware of my need, not at six hours, but in my 20s, I was very aware. I went to Liberty University. When I got there, Dr. Jerry Falwell did the orientation, and he told all the parents, he goes, you know, uh, we put these uh, young men and women up here on Liberty Mountain for about four years. We shake them up real good. We send them out, and they're pretty well paired up. Well, I didn't leave paired up with anybody, okay? That was false advertising as far as I was concerned. And so I was aware of my need, but sometimes God will put us through circumstances to make us aware of our need. But then in your notes, what I want you to see is that God arranges for man's need to be met. Amen. Amen. And God makes Adam aware of it, but he supplies that need. So in verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep. To fall upon the man. Take a nap, Adam. And folks, you singles, I want you to understand something. This is what you do. You rest in the Lord. You rest. You say, I'm going to sleep soundly in the palm of your hand, God, and I'm going to rest in you. And I'm not going to force something. I'm not going to make something happen just because I'm lonely. I'm not going to search in places where I should not be looking. I'm going to preoccupy myself with your word. I'm going to preoccupy myself with your work, with your will. That is resting in the Lord. And that is how you find your mate, or it's how you learn contentment. Because not everybody finds a mate right away. Some people don't ever find a mate. But you still must rest in the Lord. Because he is the provider of your need. He will supply your need. And it says that while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now that seems random. I assure you it is not. Because as I've said before, and I believe this comes from the Talmud, God did not fashion woman from man's head to be ruled, to rule over him. He did not fashion her from his feet to be walked upon by him. He fashioned her from his side to stand next to him and from close to his heart to be loved by him. And so you say, do you really believe this literally, Pastor Scott? Yes. You mean to tell me that you believe that God took a rib from Adam and that he made a woman out of that rib? You really believe that? I do. I do. Because as we've read so far, I've believed everything we've read so far. I believe that God created the earth in six literal days. I believe that God formed the man from the dust of the ground. If I believe that, then I can believe this. The rib is uh, is just an accelerated picture of the dust from which God formed Adam. Same components, different process. People say, yeah, yeah, but... But is that possible? Can you make a woman from a rib? That's the wrong question. The right question is, is there a God? Is there a God? Do you believe in God? If the answer is yes, then by definition, God is supernatural, and that means he does supernatural things. And so God shapes this woman. He who uh, calls into being that which does not exist 
prior can certainly form that which has no form. So is there a God? Yes, since there is, he can do supernatural things. He shapes this woman from Adam's body. And when Adam looks at that woman, we see him speak the first words ever recorded by the, by, in human language. Adam has obviously spoken. He's named the animals, but we don't know what was recorded. We have the recording of what Adam said here. And I am told that in the original Hebrew, that it most accurately translates as all right? Here's what he says. He says, Then the man said, This is a, at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He says literally this one. This one. Not the horse, not the bison, not the camel. This one is like me. This one has the bone of the bone of me. And the flesh of the flesh of me. It, she's like me. And he says, She shall be called woman. Woe man. Isha, for she was taken out of man. She was taken out of man. And so in your notes, God inspired man to appreciate the supplied need. Why is it that he makes her from Adam's rib? He doesn't make her directly from the dust. That's how he made Adam. He takes her from Adam's own body. Why? So there would be a built-in closeness, a built-in closeness between them. That is his purpose in doing it the way he did this. And because of that closeness, we're going to get the next verse. And verse 24, I'm here to tell you, is the first interpretive statement in your Bible. It's the first interpretive statement. Everything so far has been straight narrative. We've been told a story so far. Who wrote this book? A human author. Obviously, God wrote it, but he wrote it through a human author that he inspired. It was Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, okay? And he was God's appointed author, and where was it that he wrote this book? He wrote it while they were on the wilderness wandering. He wrote it between Egypt and the Promised Land. They, they wandered for 40 years, and so he wrote all five books of the Pentateuch in that time. And so the audience that would first hear this narrative are the Israelites that escaped bondage in Egypt. And where are they going? They're on their way to the Promised Land. What are they going to do there? They're going to be God's people. They're going to establish a nation. They're going to set up a government. That's the idea. Now, they're going to get a little distracted, but that's the idea. And so Moses writes this important imperative statement, and he's saying that, you know, he knows when we set up a government, part of that will be the law. These five books are the law. And he says, before we go one step further with this uh, a law in developing our government, let us now look at this foundational substructure of society. What is it? It's the family. It's the family. Let's ensure we've got the proper building blocks before we go and start a nation. We gotta know some important foundations for a nation to rest upon. And there's nothing more important for nationhood than the concept of the family. And I believe that's why the family is under such attack right now. And that's why I think America is in perilous, perilous danger is because of the destruction of the traditional family unit as designed by God. And so he gives them something. In your notes, God provides an application for marriage today. We're going to see things put into perspective here. We're going to see three relationships in this sentence right here. In verse 24, it says, therefore, that's a very important word. Don't overlook the word therefore. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, there are three relationships that are essential to marriage that are found in this one verse, okay? And in your notes, the first relationship in this verse right here is a relationship to God. And that is characterized by dependence. Dependence. Therefore, now whenever you see the word therefore, a good rule of under, an interpretation is to look and see what the therefore is there for. Okay? Some of your versions say, for this cause. For this cause. For what cause? Compare verse 23 with verse 24. Uh, at the, in verse 23, what does Adam say? He says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. How does verse 24 end? It says, they shall become one flesh. Who is it that brings about that union? It's God. God brings about the union. They become one flesh by his hand. So in Matthew 19, 6, Jesus says this, he says, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man 
separate, okay? Talking about marital union. You're one flesh. Man can't separate you. Why can't man separate this thing called marriage? Because it's not man's cause, okay? Therefore, or for this cause, the cause is God's cause, God was the one who brings them together. So that's what makes this a foundational institution. It's not man's institution. It's God's institution. So man doesn't get to flippantly separate it. Now, there are biblical justifications for divorce. We've talked about them. But God hates divorce. He hates it. So this is not something, marriage, that is to become flippant. It's not something that is a matter of convenience. It's not something you enter into just because you want to satisfy temporal whims, okay? And then when you get bored, you just move on. No, this is bigger, bigger than that. There is a divine design here. God is the author of this institution of marriage. It's not a sociological phenomenon. That's why we don't get to redefine it. We don't get to say it's, it's, it's any combination of people, you see, or genders. It's not two men. It's not two women. It's one man, one woman. It's not one man, two women. It's not one woman, three guys. It's not any of that stuff that we like to cram into this paradigm. It is God's design. And if there are three persons in this thing called marriage, that third person is God himself. And he better be invited to the wedding. Okay? You know, Jesus was invited to a wedding. And he came when he was invited. He's no wedding crasher. And he came to this wedding in Cana, and there they had a problem. And it's a good thing they invited him because they ran out of wine. And if you know that story in the gospel, uh, the the mother of Christ, Mary, was working behind the scenes, and she comes to him. She says, they've run out of wine. She tells him the problem. She comes to know the one that she knows can do something about it. And then she turns to the servants. If you recall, she says, whatever he says to do, do it. Listen, in that little story, there, there is the blueprint for your marriage right there. A, invite Jesus to your marriage. B, when you have a problem in your marriage, you turn to him. And C, whatever he says, do it. You be obedient. That's your little mini sermon within a sermon right there, okay? Question, how do you make sure you have a spiritual marriage? I've had people come to me, Pastor Scott, I just want to know, how can I make sure I've got a spiritual relationship? Well, you start with two spiritual people. You start with two spiritual people. You make sure that the two people getting married have a relationship with the Lord because that is the core relationship in a marriage. If there's sin in a marriage, you are not violating your spouse so much as you are violating God because that is the principal relationship. And for that reason, you singles out there, are you listening to me, singles? All the single ladies, right? And the single dudes, okay, you ready? Do not marry an unbeliever. Do not marry an unbeliever. God God values this very, very much. This matters to him. You don't marry someone who is not yoked up with Christ. People come up to me, Pastor, I'm so excited. I'm getting married, and I'm like, that's great. Tell me about them. Tell me about her. Oh, they're this, and they're this, and this is how they treat me, and they're just wonderful, and all this stuff. That's awesome. So are they, are they saved? Are they born again? Well, not yet. Oh. 1 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Don't set yourself up for heartache. You guys need to be yoked up with Christ and be equally yoked because of that. And by the way, don't just marry a believer, any believer. If you are a mature believer, do not marry a carnal believer. To be equally yoked means that you are both growing at the same rate. You are both maturing in Christ. Okay, And that is important because if this relationship with God is the basis for marriage, then both of the people need to be in that relationship with Christ individually. Otherwise, your marriage is a sham. It's a joke. There's already a crack in the foundation. Think about those divine institutions that we talked about. You got marriage, you got uh, government, and you got the church. And of those three, only two of them are excuse me, of those three, only one of them was founded specifically for righteous people. That's true. When God instituted marriage, there were only two people and they were both 
in perfection. They were both in perfect relationship with Christ. They were utterly righteous. They were not sinful in any way. Marriage was not designed for sinners. Not originally. Government was. Government came about after the fall. So, In fact, government is necessary because of sin. Government was born out of the reality of sin. You need government to have parameters. You need some laws to put in place because if we are left unchecked, we are sinful. We're going to run amok, so we need government. That's a divine institution. The church, as wonderful as the bride of Christ is, the church exists because of sin, because it is comprised of, of redeemed sinners. Okay, so both of these institutions are post-fall. Marriage is the only institution that is pre-fall, and that means marriage was not designed for rebels. Marriage is not designed for people who oppose God. It's built for sinners. And I want you to notice that when Adam and Eve rebel against God and they fall into sin, what's the first relationship that gets estranged? Is it the relationship with God? No, it's, it's first it's the relationship with each other because when God finds them, they're not as he left them. Because as we're going to see, it's going to say they were naked and they were not ashamed. And when he finds them, they've got stupid looking fig leaves on. There is a, a wrench thrown into the relationship. And so since it's true that the first essential relationship is God and man, that means that each of us in a marital relationship need to make it, make it a priority to deepen in our relationship with Christ. Because the closer we are to him, the better it is for that marital relationship. That's the first relationship in this verse. The second one in your notes that we see is a relationship to one's parents. One's parents. And this is, this is described as independence. Independence. It says a man shall leave his father and his mother. All right? There are typically three problems in a marriage. Finances, sex, and parents. It's true. And specifically, all right, I'm swallowing hard now before I say this. Specifically, often, mothers. Okay? Don't throw anything at me, ladies, you moms, okay? Now, there are some wonderful mothers out there, okay? But I would say often it's the guy's mother that can cause, oh, now, girls too, but I will say this. When a, when a mom marries off her daughter, that remains a daughter the rest of her life. Uh, if there's any kinks in that relationship, they were probably there before the wedding. But when a mom marries off her boy and he takes his arms off of her and puts them on another, problems can arise. You ever seen Everybody Loves Raymond? You ever watch that? There's a reason that show strikes a chord uh, with daughters-in-law in particular. Uh, the, the interplay, the dynamic between Ray's mom, Marie, and his wife, Deborah, right? That's a familiar scene, you know? You know how it goes when a wife and the son, they go over to the mom's house, and the mother's like, you look so skinny. What are you feeding my baby? Why are you raising my grandkids this way? I think I need to come over and buy you groceries. I think I need to show you how to clean that house. And there's things like that that happen. Not all uh, mothers are like that, but some, you know. Dads can cause trouble too when there's daddy's little girl and she's always gotten everything that she's ever wanted. And there's this unsaid perspective that that boy is not good enough for my little girl. Man, you can emasculate a husband quick that way. But let me tell you something. You parents, and I'm going to be there with you very soon. All right? Because my kids are getting older. Listen to me. As long as your kids are under your roof, as long as they are dependent on you, as long as they are single and somewhat dependent on you, listen, you pour into them, you speak into them, you give them wisdom, you prepare them. But when that wedding happens, cut the cord. All right? Turn them loose. Not easy, I know, but you got to do it. You got to do it. And don't wait for the ceremony. Start at the rehearsal. Start before the rehearsal, okay? Pastor Scott, you don't understand. She wants the bridesmaid dresses are so ugly. They look like, they look like Pepto-Bismol. Well, maybe that's because you make her nauseous. I mean, I don't. <laughs> Listen, they're still your son. They're still your daughter. That's not going to change, okay? It's not going to change. But the nature of your relationship will change. It will change. So pour into them when you can. There's a third relationship. We've got to move on from that. Third relationship in this verse is a relationship to each other, husband to wife and vice versa. This is characterized by interdependence. Interdependence. He says, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become 
one flesh. And that phrase, hold fast, uh, is translated in the, if you've got a King James, it says cleave. Cleave, we used to call this the leave and cleave verse. Leave and cleave. What does the word for cleave mean? Uh, the original Hebrew is dovak. Dovak, we see it in 2 Samuel. Uh, David had these guys, these elite warriors. They were, his, they were called his mighty men. And they would go into battle against the Philistines. And in 2 Samuel 23, one of them, his name is Eleazar. It says he's weary, but he goes and he fights with the Philistines. It says his hand cleaved to his sword. And he killed a bunch of these Philistines. And after the battle, they had to pry his hand off of that sword. It's like his hand and the sword became one. That's the idea here. One flesh. Now, when does a man and his wife become one flesh? At what moment does that happen? I think you know. It happens on the honeymoon. That's what this is talking about right there. You say, are you sure about that, Pastor Scott? That's what that means? Absolutely. That's why in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, it says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body, one flesh with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. All right? But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Listen, sex is God's idea. And it is designed to stay within the parameters of marriage because it is the initiation of the highest form of intimacy. It's what God intends for marriage. And it's a beautiful gift within the most beautiful gift of marriage to bring about intimacy and to put you on a path of intimacy in your relationship with one another. And and from that moment moving forward, the man and his wife are one. They are one. And, And in every area of life, you are not two people anymore. Okay, I, I am no longer simply Scott. I am Scott of Scott, Indiana. Okay, we're not individuals. Now, we've each got uh, our own personal uh, hobbies and things that we uh, do, you know, uh, but, but the, the idea is that we are one here. And you know what? Because you are one, sometimes you have to engage in the other person's hobbies. Sometimes, guys, you, you do what your wife wants you to do. Sometimes, ladies, watch a little football with the guy. Some of you are like, that ain't no problem. I like it better than he does, you know? But you belong to your spouse, every part of you. 1 Corinthians 7, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is how it's mapped out in God's word. And if that's difficult for us, especially you husbands who are like, well, I'm my own man. She's not going to change me. I got to be who I'm going to be. Look, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did he give himself up for her? Remember? Uh, He died. You get to die for this woman every day. You lay it down. You are sacrificial. And that's why marriage is not for sinners. That's why marriage isn't for rebels. Sinners, by definition, are very selfish people. We look out for our own interests. What is the highest need of a man? Respect. Some of you are reading Love and Respect by Emerson Egriches. I know you're you're going through that study, okay? And we talk about the circle. That the more a wife respects her husband, the more he loves her, and the more she feels loved, the more she respects him, and the more he feels respected, the more he wants to love and be tender to her, and the more she feels that tenderness, the more she just wants to respect him all the more. And it's, this is God's design right here. But um, respect is the highest need of a man. What's the highest need of a woman? It's tender love. It's tenderness. And in the dating phase, that comes easy because we want to impress this person. We want to win their heart. And so, you know, the guy is, man, he's just, tell me more, you know? And, and the gal's like, oh, you're just such a good man, you know? And the, there's just this mutual, I'm going to give you what you need, and you're giving me what I need. And, and then they are enjoying each other's company so much that they're just like, you know what? Let's do this for six more decades, why don't we? And they put a ring on it, you know? And they get married, and everything is lovely and wonderful and beautiful. And then one day... The two of you are in the same bathroom and one of you is brushing your teeth and the other is sitting on the toilet. (laughs) And when that day comes, the honeymoon is over. (laughs) All right? 
and you slip into a comfortability right then and attentiveness starts to wane and the man stops showing tenderness to the wife and she stops showing respect and what they showed each other before. Now you look back on it, you're like, was that just manipulation? What's going on here? And then they start to miss what they used to get from the other person and they think, you know what? And they put it together and like, oh, okay, I'm gonna show them, I'm gonna give them what they need and then maybe they'll, they'll be reciprocal. And then I'll get what I need. And so the guy's like, you know what? I'm going to start bringing her flowers for a few weeks. But then she better start to respect me. And then she's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sweet to him. I'm not going to nag him. But man, he better start doing X, Y, and Z. And, and uh, that's, that's not really godly love. What is that? When we start expecting things. Like, this is why I'm doing this is to get something. That's transactional. What do you call it when you pay up front for love and affection? You call it Prostitution. That has no place in a marriage. And so people try that. It doesn't work. And then they move on from manipulation and they move into agitation. And they start demanding things and they start to yell at each other. And the guy says, why don't you respect me? What's wrong with you? As though she's supposed to go, oh my gosh, was I not respecting you? I'll get right on that. (laughs) And then she's like, you're the worst husband ever. If you want something, fix it yourself. You know what? Why don't you go sleep on the sofa, buddy? You know, as though if I starve him or displace him, he'll suddenly turn into this sweet man, you know? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. When the north wind blows, is it going to blow your scarf off or are you going to pull that thing tighter? And you're going to double down. That's right. And so we've got to cleave to one another. You've got to remember who brought you together and you've got to remember his design and what you are to be to one another. And that is what we see here, the paradigm of marriage with Adam and with Eve. And then in verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because at this point, they didn't know any evil. There was nothing to be ashamed of. They didn't know sin. There was no sexual sin. They were operating perfectly. They were functioning in God's design in this institution. As far as they know, sex was just a part of There's nothing wrong with sex. There, there was not even the paradigm, the, the, the idea of sexual sin. That wasn't even a thing. Not one wicked thought occurred to them. And so in your notes, you see this, that God's design is a marriage above reproach. It's above reproach. And so there's a template for marriage that we see in Genesis 2. Loneliness is not good, but not just any combination of people or behaviors is the antidote for that loneliness. God has a design. There's a standard for marriage. It's his idea. He created it. He values it. He loves it. And whatever God loves, Satan can't wait to get his slimy claws all over it. Is it any wonder that the very next verse after this is what we see at the beginning of chapter 3 And it's going to read, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. I mean, right after the creation of marriage, which is beloved of God, which is instituted by God, who makes his entrance into the world? That old devil. And he targets the woman and she's separate from her husband. He divides and he conquers. And after the fall happens, what do you have by chapter 4? You've got polygamy. And what do you have by chapter 9? You've got lewdness. And what do you have by chapter 16? You've got adultery. And what do you have by chapter 34? You've got incest and then prostitution. And the devil comes hard after marriage and he corrupts it and he hasn't stopped since. And we can know the importance of marriage not just by how God highlights it but by how hard Satan fights against it. And he will manipulate it and twist it and destroy it and corrupt it and redefine it. And we can't let him do that. And this closing mandate for us here is that because God instituted this thing, it matters so much to him that we must appreciate it. We must respect it. And we must defend it. Amen? And this sets us up well for next week. Don't miss next week. Next week, It's pivotal. The fall of man. We're going to look at that incredible moment and all the heartbreak and promise.
that that story will tell. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing upon this group. May they go in peace. For all the married couples in here, I pray that you will anoint their marriage, that you will protect their marriage, that you will give them eyes only for one another and a heart for you, each one of them, Lord. And for our singles in here and for our divorcees in here, God, I pray that you would make yourself so very uh, present in their life, that they would recognize that you love them, that you still have a plan for them. And that they must trust you and rest in you for the revelation of that plan, the unfolding of that plan. And above all, whatever you have in store for them via human relationship, may they above all find their sufficiency and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Graham, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, If you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.